think uh, the topic that they gave me, I was like, okay, I do more of issues of women, but I think because my organization does this, I'll try as much as possible to call things. So I'll start by saying, others start from the, we are talking of the MDGs. We're talking of the Agenda 2063. We'll talk about uh, everything around the world. But for me, I always believe that uh, if we cannot do well at local level, the MDGs will never be achieved. So I will follow the footsteps of the, somebody who said Rwanda has developed because there is so not just commitment, but there is a political will. There's someone who is saying we have to do this and the vision is followed by everybody, not just the president. Even those who are sweeping on the street, they know the vision of Rwanda. I'm saying this because I interviewed them. Most of the people understand what, what the government is saying. And like where you have citizens like him who, are, who is saying, I did not even know SDGs, I'm hearing it today. Then it is a, 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 a bit unfortunate. So I'm saying for me, all the MDGs that have been made, I mean SDGs, 17 SDGs, how are we going to achieve them and related to the issue of technology. I will talk uh, specifically about Malawi. Malawi is one country that has uh, enacted the access to information law, enacted the access to information law. And I'm proud to say we are uh, in my organization was one of the initiators of that process. So I'm very happy that eventually we got the act itself. However, Malawi is a very nice country, very nice country, speaks nicely. At times they will not even gag media, one or two instances, but they are sitting on that law until today. They are sitting on it, they are pushing people from left to right. I think Mr. Shipari will agree with me that MISA is going everywhere trying to push the government that they should start implementing that law, but they are very quiet and they don't fight with anyone so that the, these elections should pass. Well, the issue is about elections in our countries. They do not want to lose votes because there's someone, a media person, who is trying to get information from the, the system. But there's always a saying in, our, in the process saying, you can only delay change, but you never stop it. So the media, finds a way of getting the same information that the government is trying to hide. So stay with your law, but you'll be able to get what information where it is, because there will be some sympathizers who would want to share. And therefore, I'm saying we need to do more as a country in terms of uh, pushing government to understand that we have a law that has to be enforced. Related to that is how do we really now empower our citizens, but also uh, 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 the, the, everybody, citizens, including those who are duty, uh, duty bearers versus the, the rice holders. We, we have devised a, a system in Malawi, especially my organization, that we are working at all the three levels. The level of macro, the level of meso, but also the level of micro, where we're trying to connect the three, working with state and non-state actors through the district councils. I think many people are doing that but we are also doing it in Malawi, uh, where we have now been working with the Minister of Local Government to have service charters, uh, train people, train the uh, civil servants, uh, the sectors to make sure that they are using service charters that can eventually make them account for the service that they are delivering in their councils. L like I'm saying, many councils are doing that, many countries are doing that, but my organization is also specifically focusing on that to make sure that we, we are all moving together and that uh, councils should be made to account for all what they are doing uh, because they are using uh, public resources. The issue of uh, technology. Uh, some people are saying in the Sadiq region, I think we, we've done relatively well. At times you need to look back and say, uh, how were things done in the old days? If I have very little money in the bank, I don't have to go to the bank. I don't. I can just transfer money online. I can just stand on a queue of uh, maybe just on an ATM, get my money. I can transfer money to my village using the phone. People in the village can receive information of agriculture in their, in their own homes 
when they have this small, small cell phone. They don't have to have iPhone, but they have even the small phone, very tiny, that they use just to get the information. Though, in the morning, I wanted also to agree that uh, somebody said, even rural areas, some rural areas are not reached. It's true we do not have the mass for some rural areas, but I think our governments would do better in terms of what are the opportunities that are there. The opportunities are there that the private sector need to come in to uh, uh, make sure that they are planting mass everywhere where even the rural areas can use. And when I'm talking of rural areas, I'm saying these are the, some of them are the women. The language has changed. Uh, I hope colleagues, you know, that we do not have to talk about rural with people. Uh, UN now is saying, we should be saying, I'm sure UNESCO is already aware that it should be people living in the rural area, but also women living in what? The rural area. The definition is that today Emma Kalia is staying in Windhoek, but tomorrow I'll decide to go and stay in Okashakati. Will I become a rural area person? No. Their view is that I'm just the same person, but only living where? In the rural area. So those people that are living in the rural areas, they need uh, this information. Because now there's so much education that is going out there. And people are saying, we, we demand this, we demand this, we demand this. But there's no response. If we are demanding for a, a social service in terms of uh, we, we want to have a, a post office somewhere, we have demanded, but then there's no post office, there's no terry center in our area, then it becomes a problem. So those people that are living in the rural area, they need all these services. And who can help us to do that? Community journalists, but even the mainstream media to start demanding through what we are calling the access to information laws. That's the view of some of us, because what is happening in the rural areas nowadays is quite interesting that if utilized, it can completely change uh, the, the, the development of our countries. Uh, because each time we're talking of cities, cities, yes, but the rural areas provide everything for the cities. Now, going in, in terms of uh, uh, inequalities, I think the young man spoke very well. He spoke for all of us, the one who was standing here. Issues of poverty, issues of inequalities. In terms of gender, there is a study that talks about if we do not change the way things are happening today, it will take another 100 years before we can achieve equality. There's a study, three UN women has that study that talks about 100 years to achieve equality. None of us will be there at that time. Do we really want to wait until 100 years? And therefore, this contradicts the 2030 agenda. Because 2030 agenda is saying by 20 what? 2030 on everything. On everything it is saying 2030, I think there are 169 indicators, if I remember very well, of the SDGs, including the one on media. Everything is 2030. Is that, is that true if we tend to operate the way we are operating today? Where there's no information going to people, where people, when they demand nothing, is coming back, where our leaders just want their votes and keep into office? Okay, there are certain countries that are doing better. If we compare them relatively, maybe Namibia is even better than other countries where some of us are coming from. But we are saying, if we continue just looking at the votes so that this party can win and win and win, when at the end of it all, there isn't much that they are providing to people, there isn't much where they are giving space for people to communicate, there isn't much in terms of human rights education. And uh, 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 them living up to their obligations, because the whole issue of SDGs, the whole issue of uh, Agenda 2063, when they were sitting there in Addis Ababa, sitting in the UN, approving all these things. This SADC protocol on gender and development has everything, including that of media chapter. If they cannot obligate themselves to their own, uh, own promises, then it means that it will be rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetoric. I was hearing my sister talking about entrepreneurship, and I was like, yes, good. The SADC protocol, the first one of 2008, talked about that economic empowerment and productive resources for everybody. But came 2015, 
not much had been achieved. It was that time now when the SADC was now uh, considering, okay, we should put a strategy for economic empowerment in 2015 when the proto came in 2008. I, I hope we understand each other. So we are saying a lot has to be done. Our leaders have to be a bit more focused. One leader starts something, the other one, especially where we have been changing parties, like in Malawi, if there is a strategy for the country, nobody should change it. But also, democratic processes, they should not be brought back. When we've moved, moved miles, we should not be reversing. We should be moving forward. Lead understanding as a SADC region where media is not threatened because media is there to give us information. Media is there to consolidate a, a, a democracy, democratic principles of the country. Otherwise, we will not achieve anything. I know my time now is running out. Um, who makes news in the region? <laughs> the men make news. The SADC barometer already has information. 20, it's now it has moved to, from 12 to 20% women making news. Uh, is it the problem of media or is it the problem of us? as women, what I've discovered at home is the problem of us as women who do not want to be interviewed. When it is something to do with politics, they say, I don't speak politics. When it is something hard, hard news, they don't want. They want to sp speak about, uh, do you have soft loan? This loan of 5,000 uh, uh, kwacha, this loan of 10,000 kwacha, they will not talk of big money like you are saying, my sister. That is what women are comfortable with. Very few women would want really to speak to issues that affect the democratic processes. So that is an issue where the media has to pursue maybe using the access to information or just using your own way, tactics to make sure that you are getting information for women. Opportunities, as I'm getting close at the end because I don't have much time. Social, uh, we need to make a social contracts with politicians during, just during, as you are getting closer to elections, they can become so happy when you do that because they know that if we, we refuse, they are not going to vote for us. That, we ha that too we have used in Malawi. At times it has worked, at times it has not worked, but I think we need to do that. It is an opportunity during, just close to elections to do that. Use of uh, various legal frameworks, like I've said, we should always make them account for all what they signed. Usually they would take pains everywhere they go sign, come back, like my brother said. They come, go sign, come back, they go to China. All the African leaders were in China. Now they are in Yunga, in, in New York, signing, signing, and even talking things, good things, and then they come back, they do the different, the, the opposite. Those are the things that we need to make them account for and say, here you are, there's the actual uh, Access to Information Act. Here you are, there's this uh, uh, Agenda 2063, SADC protocol, everything, everything, we talk about it, and actually the, uh, the, the conventions, the bigger conventions that are talking to social, economic, and, and the, uh, cultural rights. All those ones, I think we need to do that. MISA, to maintain, uh, sustain your efforts. Do not relate at all. I have known this MISA for a long time, you know, from the old days, Mr. Chifari, you've been around. You've been strong, and I'm saying MISA should continue. They should, you should continue making sure that they, you are visible. They should see that you are there so that they are not making any more mistakes. Because when they see that you are there, at times they are afraid. They will, they will be like, okay, media is around. They are going to, to talk everything about us. So sustain your efforts. A good, good job that you've done. Barometers, usually name and shame member states. Why don't we use the same? Any other barometer, the Afro barometer, us as women were using in Sadiq region, we are using the gender barometer. We use them. Any country that is failing, at times they get so ashamed to the point that they start saying, okay, we also want to do nice. Namibia did nice when they say they thought, no, 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 we are ragging behind on women in politics and decision making by introducing a quota. I'm happy I was here and some, something happened. We are very happy for Namibia that they moved that direction. Countries that are failing to do that, like my own country, Zambia, we are trading very behind. Then the, the last one is the, the issue of uh, investment. Member states should invest more into science and technology, especially for we, girls, women and girls who are already ragging behind. But more to it also, 
for those that are living in the rural areas, where it is really far to reach the, the, the centers of the countries, like the, the cities. So member states should take a deliberate effort to invest more, like Rwanda has done, so that we are able to, to connect very well, and I'm sure our countries will develop, and we will we'll be happy to see our countries, especially in the Sadiq region. I have to, to inform you that in the gender sector, the Sadiq region ranks number two um, to the uh, European countries. But in Africa, Rwanda ranks number one, the whole world. Thank you so much. You've been very patient, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to hear from the floor whether we take questions now or should the next group come and present? Questions? No, okay. So we will make room now for the next, um, for the last group to present, Natasha. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Emily, and the three power women panelists who've just shared their thoughts and personal experiences um, in regard to media training and related initiatives um, for women and girls in SADC. Our last and final session for this afternoon, um, I'm not going to do an introduction because of the lack of time, and I'm sure we are all very tired, uh, but the theme for this panel is good examples and practices of initiatives empowering women and girls through access to information in Africa. And I'd like to call upon my panelists, Ruth Nam Nabembedi, who's the founder of, of Ask Without Shame Uganda, and then uh, Imelda Viriri, who is the programs manager of Root Zimbabwe, and then finally, Mabeta, Man Man let me start with her name because it's the toughest one, Mante Boheleng, Mabeta, did I get it right? And she's uh, the Gender Links Lesotho Country Manager. I have only two panelists here, so it seems like uh, we have one missing, but we will start. Oh, she's not here. Okay, but so we will just um, get, go ahead and, and start with um, our panelists presenting due to the lack of time. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I know it's been a long day, but please hang in there. We're almost done. Uh, my name is Amalda Viridi, and I am the programs manager for Roots, uh, which is will open opportunities for transformation support. And we are a community-based organization operating in Zimbabwe, in the marginalized areas of Zimbabwe. I'm going to start with a quote by Shirley Chisholm, and she said that if they don't give you a chair or a seat at the table, you bring a folding chair. But then I got to ask myself, how do you bring a folding chair if you do not have knowledge? So it's very important for us to talk about access to information for our women and for our girls in the communities. And I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes just for a minute. Don't worry, there are no thieves around you, I'm sure. Just one minute, just close your eyes and picture this girl with me this afternoon. So Rumbi Zai is an 18-year-old who is HIV positive with three kids, and she's also divorced. So I don't know which face you saw, but you can open your eyes. Someone might say, how can we talk about multiple vulnerabilities for one person? But this is just one of the many uh, challenges that we've seen or a situation, real life situation 
in the communities that we serve as roots. And there are so many other girls that are vulnerable to certain um, challenges like child marriages, sexual reproductive health right, rights issues, and that is what we tackle as an organization. So how is our work as Roots responding to child marriages, sexual reproductive health rights issues, et cetera, et cetera? First and foremost, we are into radio programming. And at the moment, we have a talk show that is called Roots. And what we did with this model was to engage the adolescent girls themselves to be the ones who steer the conversation. So here we took more of a bottom-up approach and you know, eliminate the top-down approach. So the girls come up with content with the assistance of experts from the Ministry of Health and other areas to come up with content which is relevant to them. And what we, we saw was that effective communication has to do with effective messaging. So you've got to get the language right, you know? So that young people bring in the jargon that they understand, you know, if it's the slang, they bring that in and we talk about the issues that affect them um, day to day. So radio programming is part of what we do um, as we look at access to information and information dissemination. And we also look at um, providing alternatives. So as I started, I said, we are community-based. We are focusing more on the grassroots. So what we realized is that information is good and access to information is good. But our girls, when we look at the context, for example, with Zimbabwe, we have high levels of poverty in many areas. So you can provide information, but if you don't bring an alternative, you are shooting yourself in the foot. So when you were speaking about entrepreneurship, you know, we were saying that's sort of where we also want to go and we've already taken strides. So part of what we do is empower um, the girls with skills um, in terms of business. And currently we are into sanitary wear production um, in a district called Shamva. For those who know Zimbabwe, it's, in, it's a mining community, very small community. But what we did is that with the support of certain partners, we have a pad making machine. So they do not just make it for themselves, but they also sell the sanitary way, get profit that can help them to sustain livelihood. And you also have sustainability even within the organization. So that's part of what we do. And we have a goat passing project um, where you have goats and if you now have the babies, you pass on just to give them alternatives that will help them, you know, um, get out of the cycle, the vicious cycle of poverty. And what we also realized is that it takes a village to raise a child, like most of us know. And so we include um, various stakeholders when it comes to empowering the girl child, even with information. So we have what we call parents parenting groups. Here we are talking to the parents and um, giving them information, opening their eyes to what is actually there on the ground. And we also have boot camps where we have the parents and the children um, relating in a, in a very calm environment. But we also split the children, split the parents and have them in separate groups, then bring them together just to facilitate that effective communication around the challenges that adolescent girls are facing. We also engage traditional leaders um, who we know are gatekeepers of tradition, which can also have harmful traditional practices. So we engage them to own um, the aspect of empowering our girls and our women. So we support them with their court cases and help them to refer certain cases that need to be referred. And we do not leave behind men because they are very important. What we realized is we would like to move the boys and the men from would be perpetrators um, to be champions and advocates for the rights of the girl child. So um, in just two minutes, I'm gonna wrap up. Um, so we target the eradication of harmful social practices. I think I mentioned that. And we noted that it's not a one size fits all approach. So we study our target and then we come up with a strategy that is specific 
to the target group in terms of effective communication. So Roots operates mainly at community level in marginalized areas, I'm repeating myself, but to end, I'm going to say, knowledge is not power, as we all thought. Knowledge is potential power. As Tony Robbins once said, action is power. So what we do with what we have heard is what's important. So let's facilitate the action and then we walk the talk. For more information, you can visit our website, www.rootsafrica.net. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if being the last is the best or the worst of it all, because when you come to stage, everybody has said everything that you could have said, and they have taken all the words from you, but <laughs> I will still continue. My name is Mande Buhile Maveta. I work for Genderlinks as the Lesotho Country Manager. Uh, I believe everybody in this room knows gender links and they know what gender links do as a well-known SADAC NGO for making sure that they press behind gender equality and empowerment with women. Uh, as gender links is striving for the empowerment of women, they do not leave behind the fact that GBV is very high in our countries all over SADAC. And Gender Links has taken an initiative of conducting the baseline studies on the GBV status in seven SADAC countries now. And out of those countries, Lesotho was one of the highest countries with the rate of GBV. So in Lesotho, the violence is even widely accepted by women who are usually victims. At least 80% of women in Lesotho during the study admitted to having experienced some form of violence in their lifetime, with around 40% men accepting having perpetrated violence in their lifetime. And the sad story is the, the government uh, is not doing much about gender-based violence. This is shown by the lack of uh, public discourse on uh, violence against women in order to stimulate change in norms and attitude. That is, GBV is so normalized within the society, and that is not even funny. However, Lesotho have very promising national policies but these policies are just there in paper. People will tell you that if you want good policies, just go to Lesotho and you are set. But as far as implementation is concerned, you find that these policies are not in being implemented. And for women who are victims, they are not even aware of such policies because if policies are not implemented and nobody's talking about them, this means that they, people don't know about them. So as gender links, we were aware of this lack of knowledge about the existing uh, policies and laws within the country. With the help of, uh, or with the funding from GIZ last year, gender links Lesotho uh, partnered with participating for social accountability to develop a national initiative of a mobile app to create awareness on GBV. This mobile app was a partnership between the participatory initiative for social accountability, usually abbreviated as, as PISA, which is an initiative which is a combined effort of EU and the German government or BMIZ. PISA partnered with Gender Links and another organization called Main Level Consulting. Gender Links was a gender partner and Main Level Consulting was the technical partner because they were dealing with the, the, technical, the technical side of that app. 
The objectives of this app were to create awareness among women about what constitutes GBV. I said initially in the introduction that women are even accepting GBV as part of the normal life. So it was important to create awareness among women about what the GBV is. The, it was also to inform women about their rights as well as locally available support services. To also provide a safe visual space for women to share stories and support each other. And to provide women with an emergency system to alert the community members or peers or even the police, which is a vision for later when they, they experience assault. Uh, the, this, how this was developed is that the gender links worked on developing the content that should go into the app. And after developing that content, gender links engaged a local firm which produced some videos. The reason behind producing videos is that usually we know that people do not like reading, especially Africans. So if you give them a lot of text, a lot of people might not even access that information. So the videos are usually watched more often. So the, the, the content that was produced was translated into video messages, whereby the acted scenes were recorded, whereby GBV was being experienced and coming up with the ways in which to cope with such experiences or what needs to be done in case such experiences are experienced. Then out of the video clips, the, the company which was producing, the, the IT company main level produced a prototype. It's not actually the app that is out there in the market. It is still in the level or in the space of a prototype. And this was used for testing and refining. The way this app is built or the prototype is built is that it has four main features. The first feature is named your situation. This your situation feature is whereby scripted scenes to help women understand GB situations and coping strategies are shown. The second one is called your services. The your services feature is an overview of locally available related GB services. That is giving the women information about the services that they can access when they experience GBV. The third one is your rights. The your rights section is provides information on GB related laws and rights in Lesotho. And the last one is your network. Your network is vision to be an online support group where these women can talk, help each other and solve each other's problem or even just comfort each other. This one on the prototype was not fully developed. It is still an idea because during testing, it was evident that women would like to have that feature so that they can be able to share and they can be able to have that network where they can assist and help each other. This app was tested across the country with over 100 women, and this included the urban areas and the rural areas. They were tested in the capital city, Maseru, and also the outside city, as, um, outside towns, as far back as, I, I mean, as far away as Tabataka which is the mountainous district away from the city. During the testings, the lessons learned. The, the app, first of all, is first of its kind in Lesotho to have the app that is socially targeting, giving information to women around issues that affect them, as, such as GBV. This app simplifies the transfer of knowledge since it is, transfers through the mobile phone app. And women appreciate that they can anonymously access information. It's not like consulting the police or consulting whoever, maybe who you think might judge you, but they can get information anonymously in the comfort of their own home 
and prevent things like not being able to report incidences because they are scared to face whoever they need to report to. Uh, the testing also enabled more improvements to be done on the app. The only section that has acted since our videos was the your situation uh, feature. But after testing it with the women, it was discovered that videos are the most efficient way of uh, passing the message because the sections that was accessed mostly was the one which is which use videos, which is your situation. So the other two features were also um, uh, empowered through making more videos, whereby in terms of your services, different service providers were approached and they were videotaped explaining the services that they provide. And in the, in the right section, the, the, the the organizations who are dealing with uh, this, the issues of law, most especially the human, the human rights organizations, we, who are also lawyers such as Wilson and FIDA, were approached to explain different legal frameworks that are available in the country and how women can make use of such to make it more user friendly for the women. Because the first one before the testing, it was just text and most women couldn't go through the text and maybe because the legal jargon is just too much for ordinary women. But getting that explanation on a video makes more user friendly and easy for women to understand. <clears throat> the challenges. The first challenge has already been said here is digital access and skills. Uh, in, these women able to own smartphones. For the test groups, the, the Android smartphones were provided because you can only have an app in an Android smartphone. But now, when we think of the sustainability and the future of the app, how many women will have access to smartphones, especially those rural women who only have the small, small phone that May Emma has been talking about. We tried approaching the mobile firms like the Vodacoms and your Econet about using the USDD, the US, what, how do we call it? Yeah, that, but then they said you can't use it because it is very short lived, like you are kicked out when you are there, you can't stay there for more than 10 minutes. So that is still a challenge. In most Lesotho villages, there is no electricity, meaning that even if women can have access to smartphones, which we know do not last long with a battery, they, do, they cannot have electricity to be charging them regularly like you should be in cities. There is an issue of digital literacy. This was made evident during the testings when some women had to run away from the testing groups because they were intimidated by the Android smartphones. The another challenge is regarding the safety of users. Uh, there is a risk that the app might compromise the safety, of, the safety of women in abusive relationships. This was also discovered during the testing workshops where some women refrained from being part of the, training, the testing group because they were scared of their spouses knowing that they are part of the testing group, which is on the fight against GBB. Providing the last feature of your networks also places women at risk of re-victimization through online abuse and the blaming and other things. That is why the feature has not come up, but we are aware that it must pose a challenge that some victims might be, or some survivors might be further abused while they share their stories online, hoping to get some, hoping to get some advice or, or hoping to be helped. Out of the women who, 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 who where the, where the app was tested, there are some testimonies of women who have used the app and have seen the result. I'm going to read a few of such. 
This app is so important because I can get information in my own house and without anyone knowing. This was said by a young woman in the town of Mahalisuku. I have learned that violence is wrong and that I can report it or get help. A female factory worker from Maseru. I have shown the app to more than 15 women. They all wanted to have it on their phone. A survivor from, of GBP from Mahalisuku. When my husband saw the videos in the app, he saw his own abusive behavior. It changed him. He has stopped hitting me. These are some of the testimonies that were given by women after going back to them who were part of the test group. I will close my discussion by looking at the opportunities and lim limitations of mobile solutions. The opportunity is that the majority of citizens, even in remote area, have access to mobile phones. We know that this, these days an Android smartphone has become cheaper than they used to be. You can get an Android smartphone for as little as 200 back home in Lesotho. So this means that there is an opportunity of reaching more women through the app. There is easy access to information as well as communication. When you are using the mobile app, you can have peer support. You can have access to information sooner than when you have challenges of listening to the radio and other means where information is being passed. However, mobile solutions cannot change social norms, but people can change. So when you, you, you use mobile phones as a solution, they have to be backed up by deep training or by following them up with community sensitization of co or community engagement so that the community can change their norms, their social norms and their attitude. We have become aware that no size fits all solution Therefore, this means that there is need for complementary approaches, including different types of mobile solution needed to reach and address the needs of different target groups. We cannot just have one mobile app and say that that is a solution. We need to target people depending on what their needs might be. Uh, another challenge is uh, digital illiteracy cannot be supposed, it must be trained. Not everybody will be digitally literate and not everybody can use the app as a solution. Moreover, we learned that digital uh, solutions require technical support. And this continuous technical support and maintenance means there should be means at with which this can be maintained. And finally, we have learned that the using mobile phones can be quite expensive, especially the mobile apps, as they consume a lot of data. I've also stated the issue of using videos, and we know videos consume a lot of data. So this has called on for gender links and PISA and GIZ now approaching different companies, telecommunication companies for zero rating of data for this particular mobile app. And Vodafone Foundation is one, has one company which has accepted to zero rate the mobile phone. So going forward, the mobile, the, the, this app is hopefully going to be launched during the 16 days of activism this year as one of the initiatives that are there to cap GBV, high levels of GBV that are existing in Lesotho. I thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much to Mantebo Heleng Mabeta from Genderlinks Lesotho, as well as Imelda Viriri, who's the programs manager at Roots Zimbabwe. 
I'm very tired, very fatigued, but you still in, in, inspired and empowered me. <laughs> um, listening to um, the, the amazing work that you do despite, despite the challenges that you face. Um, when Mantebo Heleng said that most of Lesotho doesn't have electricity, I was quite surprised, but you still managed to do the work that you do um, using ICTs to um, create a situation where women can feel safe um, um, to um, engage on an issue that even though GBV is, is, is an epidemic in Southern Africa, we still don't talk about it uh, in a constructive way. We still don't talk of, about it in an empowering way. And, and these women can sit um, with their phones in their lounges or at home and learn more about it in a more contextualized, personal way. And then, of course, there was my sister from Roots, <laughs> who's doing amazing work. Um, I think what stood out, you said a lot of things that stood out for me, but um, effective, um, we can only achieve effective communication if we use effective language, and that the one-size-fits-all uh, model does not work. We need to target and um, create, what is it that you said here? Um, yeah, you need to have, we need to have target-specific um, strategies. The coolest thing you said for me is knowledge is potential power, action is power. Because I think it's very much true that you said that we always say knowledge is power. We have a lot of knowledge and we have a lot of information, but what do we do with it? If we go and take it over into an action, that's when we make it power. Another thing that stood out from both um, presentations is that both of you use the multi-stakeholder approach. You don't work with only one stakeholder. You work with several stakeholders, and each one of these stakeholders brings something to the project. Um, so that is also something that we can learn from that. Um, and then, of course, the power of I ICTs. Um, and another issue that stood out for me as well is another problem that we face in all of Southern Africa, and that's the lack of digital literacy. And UNESCO has been working quite a lot in that area, and I hope that um, we will continue with that. Um, I would like to now open the floor for questions and comments on both panels that we've just had. Uh, both the panel that came before this one, which was a sample of media training and related initiatives targeting women and girls in SADC, women and girls harness access to information, and the one we had now, good examples and practices of initiatives empowering women and girls through access to information in Africa. You are welcome. My brother from Niamh. Question I want to ask, how serious is this government about the issue of women and uh, children? Ladies, you are doing a good job, but I'm afraid that uh, the government themselves and even the UN, how do they keep the government accountable? Because if I read this SDG, equality education and reduce inequality. And we are seeing on our continent, even our leaders, when they are in office, they always try to make sure they have their company, they have their business. But when it comes to issues of our African girls and women, and then the other issue I wanted to know, ask you about the, the sexual reproductive health and personal development of these young ladies. What are you teaching them? And are they, their fathers, are they also involved in this training that you are giving them? How do you make sure, I think, is uh, the empowering of young people with greater control over their sexual reproductive health? And the other issue, the journalists also, I think, they fail. They don't write many, they don't cover all this, like we talk about communities. They are more concerned about Western issues that are happening in Europe and America while we are in Africa. So I'm really happy with my sisters, what they are doing there, but I'm very concerned with our governments. Do they walk the talk? Are they acting? Like today, we only hear about the SDG. How many people in this country, especially where we are standing here, and the attitude of us as Africans, how serious are we by changing our communities? 
I was just talking and talking and talking, but on the ground, nothing is happening. So I wanted, please, to ask the UN also left because we only ask about that China relation that we told that China is a global village and all these things, which I'm not so satisfied with. I believe the talents in Africa, Africa is having their own talents. If we are talking about information, Africa can also not allow others to do things. They can do their own things. Now, if we, if Chinese have developed their own technology, they made their citizens strong. What about our own? So I'm also going to that question of China and inequality. Like now in our country, we have the land conference coming and I think we'll meet the president there because these are the hard question we have to ask our governments. We cannot really play games anymore because we are now in the 21 century and the girls are suffering. Women are suffering. And this inequality have been there in the past. So I wanted to know, please, maybe our sisters can give us information. Are the fathers also involved? Or are we only trying to talk to the ladies themselves? Thank you. Um, we can take one more question. Um, if the panelists of the previous panel can please join us on stage, I would appreciate that. Please uh, go ahead. Good evening. Uh, I don't really have a question, more of a comment. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for this whole uh, event today and for everybody that stayed in uh, the energy and the information that you've brought. I myself am a, I'm in media, but I'm not a journalist, so to speak. I'm a filmmaker, I'm a documentarian. Uh, and I'm busy doing a project that um, um, focuses on women um, globally at the moment, and I do a lot of partnerships with, with other women from other countries. I just wanted to comment on, sorry, I forgot your name, from Lesotho. Um, the great thing that I like about what you were saying is that um, you guys used the power of uh, visual media. Visual media is very important as well because not everybody is literate to read actually the information um, that we put out there as we have here today. Uh, but if we can actually use a creative way, as uh, somebody, I think it was Ms. Faisal who was talking about creative way of putting um, the projects or the concepts that we have into a visual uh, platform, it's actually more powerful because then as we use um, ICTs like uh, uh, mobiles and television and stuff like that, we're able to reach more people. Um, and um, I was also speaking to Mr. Edward Turner, who was here also just concerning now financing these kind of things because uh, we don't think about, I think, um, especially journalists or documentarians in that um, field to be able to help women like that actually put their information out there. So I just wanted to comment on that and say thank you. From the floor, comment? No? Okay. Brother, you need to keep it short, ne? Okay. I think my sister mentioned about that we have a lot of problem, but no solution. The other issue we must remember, when we elect president, we give them power, we put them in positions. So they have, the, they have to find the solution. When citizens trust leadership, they have a they have lot of comfort, like we have a lot of state houses we build for them. We pay them every month. So they have, we cannot expect a community, a poor community, even they have solution, they might not do it. So I think the leadership, this thing is all about leadership. We need leadership that are really serious with their people, that they can do something and leave a legacy for their people, not just being in the state house and also maybe allow the UN to do anything, but also help the UN and work with the UN. So I wanted also to put, as we are government, but we want to say, please, government must pull up Uh, you are welcome to respond. Okay. All right. That's a mouthful. But I think for me, I'll just tackle on the issue of the government. And my question to you is, who's the government? Because the government also includes us. And you're right to say they're leaders who are supposed to be accountable but we have to make them accountable. I don't know about here, but for us, you can petition the government. If you find out there's a challenge or like here, you're talking about transparency. 
What did they sign when they went to China? Write a petition. Have people sign and then take it to them so that they provide information. Who knows, you can get to sit with the Speaker of Parliament and he takes you through the processes. So make them accountable. There's so much, you know, anger there, but channel it towards having them, you know, be accountable, but use the means that they understand. If we talk about it, if we rant about it, we're not gonna get the attention that we want, but petition and go through the proper channels and you'll get information. Earlier on, in terms of the men, I did mention that we do engage the fathers because you also have a role to play in terms of guarding your, your girl child, or even in terms of gender-based violence, protecting your wife or protecting the fellow women in your, in your life. So we do include um, men to make them champions and advocates of the rights of women. And then you asked, what are you teaching the young people? When we look at comprehensive sexuality education, we're talking about prevention. We're talking about diagnosing treatment. We're talking about counseling. So th there are all those services in one because already we've noticed that there's a gap in terms of communication. The youths or the adolescents do not have good friendly services you know, where they can get information. So we do provide that information on how they can prevent themselves from STIs, HIV, et cetera, et cetera, and then provide the counseling that they need. But I think my colleagues will help. I'd just like to answer two on the one on uh, government, how do you hold government accountable? In South Africa, for example, civil society organizations came together and started making a noise and started raising the issues consistently around what was happening, around the Gupta saga, around Zuma's leadership. And also with the Gupta thing, it was a community print newspaper that broke the story. They questioned the free report farm in the free state and they questioned how it was bought, why, and why no money or any profit, even community. Um, and then our bigger commercial newspapers picked it up. Amabungani, Daily Maverick, EWN, and they started doing investigations and started following through. So when I spoke earlier about the role of community media and the power that community media has, community media is right there. They have their ears on the ground. They see things happening in their community. They can break a story. They don't necessarily have to go and do the research further or go beyond that. Your mainstream media picks it up and takes it further. Um, and what the state capture is here today because of what the civil society organizations had done. They collaborated, they pulled their budgets together, they eventually got some donors to come on board, but it, we have to take the initiative. We have to remind government that we have voted for them and that we can vote them out again. And I would like to speak to the issue around sustainable development goals and the fact that our governments go and sign for such. Indeed, somebody has to sign on behalf of other people. And the work that we do all together in here, everyone where they are, we are working towards the achievement of the sustainable development goal hand in hand with the government. If the government is not taking an initiative, we are there as citizens, we are there as non-governmental organization, and we must do something. That is why Agenda Links, we will be working with the government and trying as much as possible with the little that we have to make sure that our governments are geared into the right direction towards what kind of solutions are there in order to address the problems that are there because SDG 5 requires the achievement of gender equality. It looks anti elimination of gender-based violence and other issues. And we can't sit and wait as citizens and say, we are waiting for the government to come up with measures to eliminate gender-based violence. It is everyone's responsibility where they are sitting to assist the government to achieve the sustainable development goals, to achieve the SADA agenda protocol or any other protocol that they sign for. And in doing that, we also have to work in partnership with the government. For 
example, the app that I have talked about, we have now engaged the government. It was just a prototype while we were testing it. Now, because it was tested out there, we have engaged the government. We have brought the Ministry of Gender on board to take forward this app and maybe even bring their know-how and make it even better because we have shown them the way and we expect them to carry it forward. It is very important to include men in the fight against GBV, not just to assume them as perpetrators. And just like my sister had rightly said, we as gender links also work with men in addressing the issues of gender-based violence to make sure that they can be pro protectors, not perpetrators. Um, I just wanted to respond on um, how can we involve the policy makers and the political leaders. So um, what we do is we do not stop our work because uh, there is, of course, uh, from where we come from, from Zimbabwe, there is um, a lack of political will on issues uh, to do with uh, girls' uh, uh, empowerment. But we don't stop because the, the, the politicians are not willing. We don't stop because the policymakers are not willing. Um, also, if uh, you realize that um, we focus on the small communities, we start from the bottom up. So um, if you, you uh, look at uh, the setup, how the setup is, we start from the councillors, the local councillors. Uh, if you approach them, the, the, the local, it's easier to approach the local councillor, and then you go up, you approach the, uh, uh, the legislators, and then, you know, it's, it's, we want to create a ripple effect. Uh, the local leaders that we have, we have to, to touch their lives. We have to show them that we have something uh, uh, to offer. And it's so easy to approach the, the community leaders uh, uh, and to acknowledge them and to involve them in what we are doing. And when we do the power classes for women, we look for those local leaders. Those are the ones who talk to our girls, the local uh, community leaders. Those are the ones who talk to our girls. And we make sure that uh, whatever they, they say to them, um, it, it, it impacts them and it, we, we create a ripple effect. One person impacts the next person. The, if you give information to one person, you've, uh, uh, and when we do this uh, power classes for women, we encourage our girls to, to talk about it on social media. We spark debate. We, we, we spark uh, conversation on certain issues. And you find out that social media is a very powerful tool when it comes to uh, uh, dissemination of information. So we, we make sure that the girls don't just uh, come, but they actually benefit from the local community leaders. So the involvement, eventually, they will, the, the policymakers will come on board because there will be debate over, uh, on certain issues coming from the communities, the grassroots. So that's how we, we, we involve the, the, the local leaders. And um, on what we are teaching, uh, issues to do with uh, the sexual and uh, uh, reproductive health rights, um, you would find out that um, we, sometimes we demonize uh, uh, people, sometimes we demonize the leaders, but they are willing to share what they have. Sometimes we, it's just a perception that people have, but sometimes it's not, it's not actually what's, what's on the ground. So we have to approach them. When we face resistance, we don't stop. We just keep approaching them, you know, uh, in such a way that they, uh, we, we don't have to be antagonistic, uh, uh, antagonistic or to have that us versus, uh, us versus them attitude. Because sometimes we, we, we are just, it's just a perception, but they are willing to come on board. Let's make sure that as civic society, let's make sure that these people come on board with what they have. And it's so easy now for, for us to uh, 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 take them to task and to demand accountability. Because it's not about we are demonstrating or we are protesting about anything, but we are just asking them uh, in a polite way to come on board with what they have. And then we discuss and uh, find out how we can improve uh, 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 the, the emancipation of uh, women and girls. So basically, that's what we do. Thank you. Are there any other? Okay, I'm being told by my colleague over there, no, no, no. He's denying me my right to free expression and access to information. But that is okay. <laughs>
Well, thank you so much, sisters, comrades, colleagues, um, for your contribution here today. Uh, best practices, I think that's what's standing out for me today. I've learned so much about the amazing work that's being done across the, uh, this region by women, um, ensuring that um, our gender equality goals are being achieved. So thank you so much. A round of applause to our panelists. And now we've come to the last item on our program for today. The closing remarks by Dr. Jean-Pierre Ilbudo, who is the head of UNESCO Wintuk, which has also been our host here today. Oh, am I taking your job over? Is it okay? Okay, so thank you so much for this opportunity as well. Thank you very much. Um, applause for Natasha, please. She did a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I closed you, uh, Natasha, because the owners of the premise want to prepare for another event tomorrow. We, we had booked to be out by 5.30. It is now 23 minutes to 7. So that's the reason why we, could, we really cannot stay in any, any unnecessary minute longer. <laughs> um, so please forgive me for that. Um, some uh, just brief comments from our side, UNESCO Harare. There will be proper closing, hopefully too, uh, very brief as well, from, uh, from our host here. Um, we, were, we are very grateful for all of you for being so patient. Um, special thanks to those who came from the region. Uh, I think you agree with me, the content was rich. I learned a lot uh, about what is happening and how, how access to information is empowering women. So, although the room looks empty, believe me, there are thousands of followers who have been streaming live the whole session. That's why it was important for us to get to the end. So, it, it has been streamed live, or every session has been live, but also UNESCO, our headquarters in Paris will make a film after. It's a, an after film of all the IPDC talks around the world. There are 10. And believe you me, your face probably will show on that. Uh, films comes in two versions, one unedited and the other one edited, short clip that's normally posted on, on YouTube. But um, if you do see your face there, so now you know how you got there. And um, I hope it's all exciting because that starts the conversation. We've just begun here. It will continue online. And um, maybe today we invited you to Vendor. Tomorrow maybe you'll go to New York. Who knows? Thank you very much. I don't want to say any more. Just housekeeping. Departures for airport tomorrow. Please listen to your name and please indicate if you are not in the list. Tomorrow morning at 5.15 a.m. Ezekiel Lamini, the one speaking. Mabeta. Um, Shatewa, 5.15 a.m. Um, 10 a.m., Melanie, Faisal, Emma, Delta, it is half past 6 a.m. It is written here, 06.30. It will be Ashley, Farai, and Laxi. Anybody out? Anybody who has missed? Everybody uh, who's traveling heard when they are, they're getting picked up. These are picked up times at the hotel. I believe it's about two hours or so before your flight. Thank you very much. I pass on the mic. The closing. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you, Ezekiel. On behalf of uh, UNESCO Headquarters Paris, the ADG Communication, Assistant Director General of Communication Information that you have from Tunis today, on behalf also of uh, our regional director, Professor Heisen Hubert, from the regional office, Harare. On behalf of my own office here in a small office, national office of uh, Windhoek, I would like to express our gratitude to all of you, uh, especially to the national office of uh, Windhoek, I would like to express our gratitude to all of you, uh, especially to those who came from outside. Zimbabwe, Lesotho, Zambia. Um, I think uh, I'm not. Huh? Malawi. Malawi. All those countries, I think that you have done a good, good job. I would like also to 
express my gratitude to the facilitator, Joseph, Emily, Natasha, Zoe Titus. Good facilitation, excellent content also from our different keynote speakers, from our different panelists. The, the content was so valuable. Unfortunately, reasons are there why our audience was poor. I heard about the end of the month, about the graduation of uh, Swiss Unum, about also the fact that uh, we had this breakfast at 8.30, people couldn't move from there to here. It could be also our witness and uh, mobilization. It could be, but the steering committee was sitting for three months discussing this issue we need to assess and to see why we didn't have this audience that we were expecting, especially the students of School of Journalism, because they should have been learning so much today if they were here with us. In any case, we have done a good job, despite all these, these poor attendance. And I hope that the report of those IPDC talks with all your intervention will be put together, will be made available for us to have a learning document to continue to inspire ourselves about those SDG 16 and 5. Gender issues are a big issue in Africa, we know that. Personally, I think it's first gender sensitivity. The males are not sensitive to gender things. They think that they are the bosses, they decide everything. We need to work on that seriously and starting by the kindergarten and the primary school to make sure that our youngs there are gender sensitive. It's about also access to information. We have a trend to think it's for only media, it's not true. I think that we have insisted enough about the access to information for citizen, the normal citizen. Citizen Epsilon, Citizen Alpha. We need really to promote this right to information for those citizens and then this civil society organization is doing that. And um, I would like also to say thank you to those who was asking those questions. And I would like to conclude about government. We are talking about government. We are waiting too much, according to me, from our government in Africa especially here in Namibia. I'm here since three years only, but people are waiting too much. I think that we need to mainstream self-development spirit in citizens in Africa, in Southern Africa. Your government cannot do everything for us. But if you are able to organize ourselves, to put some money, even a coin of five dollars, Nigerian dollars, a community can do many things a den, a, a repair things, engage in development issues, and this is very important. And I will conclude with a statement, a philosophical statement of uh, Friedrich Engels to Feuerbach, the 11th statement. He was saying that the philosophers has been interpreting the world in different ways. The most important thing for us today is to transform this world, this world. Let's transform it to have gender equality, to have quality education, to have access to information. I thank you.